Section 8.7, the alternating series test. So the alternating series test requires the three things you see listed. So suppose we have a sequence a sub n such that number one, all the terms in that sequence are positive. Number two, that sequence is strictly decreasing. And number three, the limit of that sequence is zero. If those three things are true, then the series you see here, which I'm going to call an alternating series, and we've mentioned this before, but you can see if I write out a few terms for that, it would look like a sub 1 minus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 minus a sub 4, and so on. And so you can see why I'm calling that an alternating series. In particular, it's this factor right here that's making those terms alternate in sign. Meanwhile, the a sub n part is strictly positive and forms a decreasing sequence whose limit is zero. If that's the case, then this alternating series converges. Now, realize that not all alternating series converge, and even if all of these requirements are not satisfied, that still doesn't mean that our alternating series has to diverge. This is a sufficient condition. That is, if three, these three things are true, then I'm guaranteed this alternating series will converge. There are other alternating series that diverge, and if one of these three things, for example, was not true, that doesn't necessarily mean this alternating series diverges. So the only thing, again, that I know for sure is if these three are true, then this alternating series definitely converges. Proof. So let's look at the sequence of partial sums S sub 2n. So I'm suggesting a, an even index partial sum sequence. So for example, if n was 1, we'd be looking at S sub 2, which would be a1 minus a2. So I'm talking about the sequence of partial sums for this series. If n was 2, we'd be talking about S sub 4, which would be a1 minus a2 plus a3 minus a4. Let's write one more. If n was 3, we'd be talking about S sub 6. In general, we would be talking about S sub 2n, which would be a1 minus a2 plus a3 minus a4 plus dot dot dot. And of course, we can see that the last one, which ends in that even index of 2 or 4 or 6, is always negative. And in fact, this is the 2n index value that this partial sum ends in. So that means down here our s sub 2n would end in plus a sub 2n minus 1 minus a sub 2n. And there's what the typical even powered partial sum would look like. Um, notice if we look at this carefully that when we pair these into a1 minus a2, a3 minus a4, plus dot dot dot, there will be a number of pairs because there's an even number of terms. In fact, there's the last pair. Okay, what are the things we assumed about this sequence? We assumed that all of these a sub n's were positive, and we also assumed that this sequence of a n's was decreasing. Okay, notice if this sequence is decreasing that this number is larger than this number. That is, a1 is larger than a2. Similarly here on this second block, a sub 3 is greater than a sub 4. Again, because this is a decreasing sequence. Okay, that means this number is positive. It means this number is positive. 
and then every one of these pairs where we're taking a larger number minus a smaller number will always produce a positive result. Okay, that means if I'm adding up a positive and a positive and all these other pairs produce positive results, then I know S sub 2n is definitely positive. And of course, I can also see that S sub 2 is less than S sub 4, is less than S sub 6, and so on, so that this S sub 2n sequence is definitely increasing. And that makes sense. Every time I add on a new term, I'm adding on another one of those pairs, which means I'm adding on a larger or another positive number, which just makes the sum a little bit bigger. So this sequence is increasing. So let's write what we've got so far. We've got that s sub 2n is greater than 0. And number 2, this sequence s sub 2n is increasing. Okay, now let's write down s sub 2n again. So again, we said that was a1 minus a2, a3 minus a4, plus dot dot up to the next to the last term, which is a sub 2n minus 1 minus a sub 2n. Okay, let's group these a little bit differently this time. This time, let's leave the a sub 1 by itself, and let's write these next two terms as minus a2 minus a3, which means the one after that would be minus a4 minus a5, up to the next to the last 2, let me insert here the one before a sub 2n minus 1, would be a sub 2n minus 2. So at the very tail of this s sub 2n partial sum, there would be a minus a sub 2n minus 2 minus a sub 2n minus 1. And that would leave this little minus a sub 2n at the end. Okay, what do we notice here when we look at these terms, the way they've been grouped? a2 minus a3 is positive, again, because the a sub n sequence is decreasing. So that number is positive, and so is this one, and so are all of the other pairs I've grouped the same way up to that last pair. So every one of those pairs produces a positive result. And so what do I basically have here? I have a sub 1 minus a positive value, minus a positive value, minus a bunch of other positive values, minus a sub 2n. And that is supposed to be s sub 2n. Okay, what does that line tell me? Well, it tells me that when I take the positive number a sub 1 and I subtract all of these values, all of these positive values, I get s sub 2n. Of course, if that's true, that means a1 has to be larger than s sub 2n. Because how am I getting s sub 2n? I'm taking this positive number and subtracting a bunch of other positive values. That means a sub 1 started out larger, and then I made it smaller by subtracting all of these to get my final answer. That means a sub 1 has to be larger than the s sub 2n partial sum. All right, now let's call that number 3 to put with these two facts up here. And you should see that number 1 and number 3 tell me that s sub 2n is greater than 0, but less than a1. Okay, what does that say? It says that the partial sum sequence with even index values is bounded above, bounded above by a1, which is some positive value, 
and what else did we say up here in number two? We said that this even partial sum sequence was increasing. Okay, we've seen this before. What's the conclusion you can make when you know a sequence is bounded above by some value and that sequence is increasing? Well, our big theorem from section A2 said that if you have a bounded sequence, bounded above, that's increasing, it must be a convergent sequence. So the conclusion here is that this sequence converges. Okay, now notice, what is S sub 2n? It is, of course, A sub 1 minus A sub 2, A sub 3 minus A sub 4. So it's the same thing we've been writing, plus dot, 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 up to the last term, which is actually minus a sub 2n. OK, let's look at what is s sub 2n plus 1. Well, that would just be a1 minus a2 plus a3 minus a4 up through, well, the last term in this partial sum would be a sub 2n plus 1. The next to the last term in this partial sum would be the minus a sub 2n. Okay, now do we notice, if we compare these two, that s sub 2n plus 1 is really just s sub 2n plus a sub 2n plus 1. How do I get from this partial sum to this one? I just add one more term. It's this term right here. Otherwise, these two are just the same partial sum. You're just adding that one extra term. Okay, now that means, and we're at the uh, punchline now, if I take the limit as n goes to infinity, of s sub 2n plus 1, that would be equal to, if it exists, the limit as n goes to infinity of s 2n plus a sub 2n plus 1. Okay, what is, and I'll separate this into two parts, what is the limit as n goes to infinity of s 2n? Well, I don't know the value, but I do know it exists because we have proven up here that that even sequence converges. So there is some value that I get when I take the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub 2n plus the limit n goes to infinity of a sub 2n plus 1. Well, here's the one other thing in our theorem we assume that we haven't used yet, which is number 3. In number 3, we assume that the limit of the a sub n sequence is 0. Well, if the limit of the a sub n sequence is 0, then a sub 2n plus 1 also goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay, what does that say? It says the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub 2n plus 1 is also L. It's equal to that same limit that the even subsequence converges to. All right, now I know you remember from your homework the problem that they called the, the zipper theorem that we've referenced a couple times that says if you have a sequence that's decomposed into two parts, the even subsequence and the odd sequence or subsequence, if those two subsequences both converge to the same value, which they do, what does that say about the overall sequence of partial sums? Well, that sequence also converges to that same value. And since this S sub n was the partial sum for this alternating series, we now know that that converges. And basically, we're invoking the zipper theorem to make that conclusion. All right, so in short, though, just to repeat it, what is the test? The test is very simple. When you have your series, you're going to spot some factor that looks like negative 1 to the n plus 1. Now, by the way, 
does that exponent have to be only an n plus 1? Could it just be an n or an n plus 2? And the answer is it could be any of those things. Anything that makes the sign alternate when you go from one term to the next in the sum. The important part is, though, when you take away this part that makes the terms alternate in sign, the remaining part needs to be positive, it needs to have a limit of zero, and it needs to form a decreasing sequence. These are the three things you're going to check and confirm. And once you've demonstrated that those three requirements are met, you can simply invoke the alternating series test and conclude that this series converges. So for a couple of quick examples, let's suppose we have a very standard series, n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 1 over n. Of course, when I write it this way, I recognize, again, that this is n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 1 over n. And so I'm definitely looking at the 1 over n part as being the a sub n. And then the only thing you're going to show or write out to show the test is number 1. Um, is a sub n positive? And that's trivial in this case. There's nothing to prove. Uh, the answer is yes. 1 over n is clearly greater than 0 for all n. Number 2, uh, and you don't have to do these in any special order, what's the limit as n goes to infinity of that a sub n part? Well, that's also easy. And there's not really much to do there other than just make the observation that that limit is 0. Okay, number three, this is the one where there's a little bit of gray about how much you need to show. What I need to be able to prove or demonstrate is that this sequence, 1 over n, is decreasing. Now, for a sequence as simple as 1 over n, you don't really need to write out anything for me. It's very clear that when I compare 1 over n and 1 over n plus 1, which is the next term in the sequence, that 1 over n plus 1 is less than 1 over n. And that suffices. There's nothing more to say. So for a problem like this, what do you need to show me for work? Uh, just list these three things and observe that they're true. Once you've observed they're true, the conclusion is automatic from the test. This alternating series converges because the 1 over n part, there was a little invisible 1 in the top, that part satisfies these three requirements. Let's try another one. Let's say we have the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity again with a negative 1 to the n plus 1. Notice that the n plus 1 power just starts this series off with its first term being positive. Notice if the series started out with something like a negative 1 to the n, where that index value starts at 1. That means if this was a sub n, this would be minus a1 plus a2 minus a3 and so on. It would just shift things so that the negative term would happen on the odd index terms instead of the even ones. So it's still alternating. It doesn't really matter whether it starts out negative or positive. So I'm just going to stick with, for our example, one where the first term is positive. And let's say this one is negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n plus 2 over n times n plus 1. Again, for the alternating series test, it's really simple. Number one, I'll just ask, is it true that if a sub n is n plus 2 over n times n plus 1, is that a sub n positive? Yes, it's very clear that n plus 2 over n squared plus n is positive for all integer values greater than or equal to 1. 
there's really nothing to, to demonstrate there. Uh, number two, what about the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 2 over n squared plus n? Um, we could use L'Hopital's rule, but at this point we've seen something this simple often enough to know that the limit is definitely zero if the power of the polynomial in the denominator is greater than the power of the polynomial in the numerator. Definitely a zero limit. Number three, is the sequence a sub n equals n plus 2 over n squared plus n decreasing? Okay, now, this is the one that you may sometimes have to write out a little bit more on. And I should say that actually number 2 you might have to sometimes do a little bit more on. If it's not obvious that the limit of this expression is 0, you may have to demonstrate L'Hopital's rule. Um, for number three, it's definitely not always obvious that a sequence like this is decreasing. We've mentioned this before. In fact, what is the most common technique for showing a sequence like this is decreasing? I've, I've done this in another video. If I said, let's look at the function f of x equals x plus 2 over x squared plus x, what's the simple way that I could show that function is decreasing? I could take the derivative and show that the derivative is negative. In this case, if I took f prime, it would be x squared plus x minus 2x times x plus 2 all over x squared plus x squared. So that means f prime would be minus x squared minus 3x over x squared plus x squared which of course is just minus x squared plus 3 over x squared plus x squared. And at that point, I think it's pretty obvious that for all x values greater than or equal to 1, this derivative is negative. The denominator is always positive. x squared plus 3 is always positive. That negative will guarantee this derivative is negative. Okay, since that derivative is negative, that means this function is decreasing, and that function is the real value version of this sequence. This sequence is definitely decreasing. So this will suffice usually when you're trying to show that this sequence is decreasing if it's not immediately obvious. You can just do a derivative and demonstrate to me that that derivative is negative. Okay, now... I've done those two examples, and that's, that's really all I'm going to do for basic examples of the alternating series test because it is so cut and dry in how you apply the test. Um, however, uh, there is one other theorem we want to look at. Theorem, suppose we have an alternating series. for which the hypotheses of the alternating series test are met. That is, number one, um, a sub n is positive. Number two, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals zero. And number three, the a sub n sequence is decreasing. So in other words, this is a convergent alternating series because it meets the three requirements of the alternating series test. So let's say we have our alternating series, we know it converges, and we got to that conclusion because these three things were true. Then the conclusion of this theorem is that if I take the sum, and let me just insert here, suppose that since this converges, let's say this series converges to the sum s. Let's call the answer for this series s. Then the conclusion of this theorem is that when I take the difference between s, which is the sum of this series, and the nth partial sum, 
that the absolute value of the difference of those will be less than a sub n plus 1. All right, now, proof-wise for this one, let's just look at a picture because this will be uh, good enough to get the idea. So let's think about, again, what does this series look like when I write out the n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1, a sub n. We know that's a sub 1 minus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 minus a sub 4, and so on. Okay, so let's say I wanted to approximate this sum by just stopping at the third term. Obviously if I do that I'm omitting the tail of this series which means what's left is only an approximation of the true value of this infinite series. And the question is how good an approximation is that? Well let's see. If I started out at zero what's the first thing you do when you start to add up a1 minus a2 plus a3. First you add a1. a1 is a positive value, so you end up somewhere here, somewhere larger than 0. Okay, what's the next thing you do? You subtract a2. Now remember, the a sub n sequence is decreasing, so in particular that means a sub 2 is less than a sub 1. That means when I subtract a sub 2, I'm going to go backwards here on the number line, but I'm not going to make it all the way back to zero. When I subtract a2, if its value is less than a1, then I'm going to end up somewhere back here, but not all the way back where I started. So let's say this is a1 minus a2. Okay, what's the next thing you do? You add a3. And what do we know about a3? a3 is less than a2, which means when I add a3, if we observe that this distance right here is a2, then when I add a3 to this, I'm not going to make it all the way back to a1. I'm going to be somewhere short of that. So let's say I land right there. All right, now notice what we're saying there let me do this in another color, is that this distance right here, where this point where we stopped at was the second partial sum, and this point where we've stopped is S sub 3, the third partial sum, the distance between those two is actually A3. Now, we could say a couple of things then. If I stopped at S2, that is if I used only the first two terms to approximate this sum, notice that the real answer or the solution to this series would have to be somewhere in here. It certainly could not be above S3. If I keep adding and subtracting and every time I add or subtract, I'm moving to the right or the left by a smaller amount than I previously did, what I'm really going to do as I add and subtract those terms is bounce back and forth in between here. Which means when I take a1 minus a2 and then I add a3, I cannot go beyond this point. And that also means that when I subtract a4, I can't go below that point. So let me draw this picture again getting a little cluttered there. And let's follow the logic here. I land at a1. I subtract a2. I add, and by the way this should be a1 minus a2. I add a3, which means now I'm at a1 minus a2 plus a3. I subtract a4 which won't put me all the way back here, it will put me somewhere greater than that. So let's say this point is a1 minus a3 minus a2 plus a3 minus a4, and it's the minus a4 that I subtracted to get from here to here. In particular, we're saying this distance is a4. All right, now, 
let's say I stop right here. That number on the number line represents S sub 3, which is the A1 minus A2 plus A3. And if you look carefully at the picture, you should be able to see now that the real sum for this series has to be somewhere in here. It can never go below this number again. Because as I add and subtract these decreasing absolute value terms, I'm really going to bounce back and forth in that little interval of length a sub 4. Okay, what that means is my true answer is somewhere where I've shaded in green, which means if I stop at this point and use that as the approximation for my sum, what is the worst case upper bound for my error? The answer is it's a sub 4. What's the worst case? The answer to your series could be over here somewhere. Well, I know the maximum distance from here to here is A4. So I can certainly say that the value of this series take away the third partial sum, which is just the first three terms, cannot be any larger than the absolute value of the fourth term in this series. And this is the picture demonstration or proof of this idea. In fact, we can state this theorem in a little plainer way. Let's just say that if we approximate the alternating infinite series of that form by S sub n, which is the nth partial sum, the error in, let's say, using this as an approximation for the actual sum of the series is no larger than the absolute value of the next term in the series, i.e. a sub n plus 1. Again, what is s sub n? It's a sub 1 minus a sub 2 plus dot 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 up to plus or minus a sub n, whatever that sign on that last term is. And what we're saying is if we stop at that nth term, what's the next thing we would do to get to s sub n plus 1? We would add a sub n plus 1 or subtract it, depending on what the sign of the previous term was. And this is the maximum distance away from the true sum that this nth partial sum could be. That means this, a sub n plus 1, is the maximum possible error. In fact, really what I should say is that it's an upper bound on the error. It actually can't be as big as a sub n plus 1. It does have to be less than. And that's how we stated it on the previous page. We said that the actual sum take away the nth partial sum. Okay, That difference would be the error of using this as an approximation for this we're saying that error has to be less than the absolute value of the next term. And the next term in this sum would be a sub n plus 1. Okay, this is a very easy theorem to use. In fact, let's go back and look at our previous example of n equals 1 to infinity, uh, negative 1 to the n times 1 over n. Okay, and of course, we already went through this one. We saw that it was convergent. All three of the requirements for the alternating series test were met. So this guy converges. If I write out what the terms look like, what do they look like? And by the way, this was n plus 1. Uh, the first term should be 1. Second term should be minus 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth plus 1 fifth minus 1 sixth and so on. 
All right, what is, let's say, S sub 3? It's 1 minus 1 half plus 1 third. Um, and what is that? It's 6 minus 3 plus 2 over 6. So it's 1 half. Or maybe I should say 5 sixths. How about that? All right, now, I know S sub 3 is only the sum of the first three terms. Obviously, I am leaving off all of the rest of the tail, all of those infinitely many terms and the rest of this alternating sum. And at this point, you should be seeing the power of this estimation theorem. It says that if I want to approximate this sum by just using these first three terms, the error in that approximation will be less than the absolute value of the next term. What that means is the true value of this series, n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 over 1 over n, may be approximated by 5, 6 with a guarantee, let's say, that the error of this approximation is less than one-fourth. And just for a reference here, I'll tell you that this series we're talking about actually sums to about 0.6913. And you'll see where that number is coming from in, in one of the next few sections. So we'll actually figure out how to come up with this sum exactly. But I'll just tell you for now that uh, that is accurate out to four decimal places. Okay, what is my approximation that I'm getting using just these first three terms? We're saying that it's 5, 6. If you take the difference between 5, 6 and 0.6913, you get an error of about 0.14. And notice that error is much less than the 1 quarter. So notice what we're saying is this 1 quarter is not the error. It's an upper bound on the error. The actual error of this approximation may be much less than this one quarter number that I've come up with, but it does give me a safety. It says that if I go out to the third term in this series, the error in stopping at that third term will be no greater than the absolute value of the next term. Notice, if I erase a little bit of this, that if we went out to the fourth term, so 1 minus 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth, which means the next term, if I continue the series, would be 1 fifth. But if I stopped at the fourth term and used only S sub 4 as my approximation, um, which is what uh, that'll be, oops, be 5, 6, be 14, 24, it'd be 7 twelfths. Okay, let me punch 7 twelfths into a calculator. Um, if you punch 7 twelfths into a calculator, you get about 0.583 repeating. And if you take the difference between that and this number I'm telling you is the true value of the sum, uh, you get something around 0 0.10, 0 0.11. Let's say it, let's round it to 0 0.11. So we're saying the error in stopping at the fourth term is 0 0.11. Of course, down here, notice that's a little bit smaller than the error we had in stopping at the third term. But notice, my theorem says I am guaranteed, no matter what, that the error in stopping at this fourth term will definitely be less than the absolute value of the fifth term. And, of course, the absolute value of that fifth term is 0.2. And we just figured out that the actual error is around 0.11. Again, the actual error is much less than this upper bound. 
but I am safe in saying that the error can be no larger than 0.2. Okay, so as it turns out, this is one of the few series that has such a super simple way to estimate how good an approximation you get in stopping after a certain number of terms. And we haven't done a lot of this so far, but as you'll see in the next few sections, this is really one of the primary practical uses of infinite series. Uh, we oftentimes cannot compute the actual limit of an infinite series but if we know what the convergence is like in terms of how fast it converges, sometimes we can use a certain small number of terms to approximate the sum. And so this is the first time we've seen that. And alternating series are definitely the simplest of all. The rule is very simple. If I want to stop after a certain number of terms, then I'll stop and I know the error will be no larger than the absolute value of the very next term in that series. Okay, we'll stop there. Let me know if you have any questions.